scout group doing an activity. To follow on from uh, the first session, we were playing a game called Live Monopoly. There was something like 900 scouts running around London trying to visit all the streets on the Monopoly board. Uh, so uh, we were quite happy that uh, there was four teams from my group and we actually came, one of our teams came fourth place out of 169 teams. Uh, so we're very happy with that. Oh, that's, I think we did. So it starts at 9.30 and you have to go around all the streets until 5pm. So it's very good fun and uh, something that lots of people get involved with. So. But moving on to what we're here for today, uh, don't varnish over the cracks. So I'm going to look at how you can use Drupal to serve very fast sites for logged in users. The common thought that uh, Drupal has a lot of problems with delivering sites for logged in users, a lot of heavy database work once you're, you're dealing with logged in users. So just to start with some of the things that I'm not really going to cover uh, today. So firstly what the stack options are going to be, you know, first thing that you're going to want to do is try and do all your tuning on your, uh, your servers, what you're using, the version of PHP, making sure those are all tuned. Then database, you know, do you use MySQL, do you start to use MariaDB, how do you tune those to make best performance? And then finally things like content delivery networks for speeding up the delivery of images and uh, things like that. So I'm not going to cover any of those. But what we are going to talk about is caching all the things because everything can be cached really in Drupal. It's not just about that final layer of caching the final rendered page, but caching every stage through the site, every bit that we can. So we want to think about how can you cache the things in the site. So we can think about by role. So if this is just a general anonymous user, we can cache everything. Authenticated users, we can start to have to not cache some things. But then we look at something like an administrator where you don't want to cache anything. So it's splitting up those levels, then by the individual user. So if you're talking about something like e-commerce, where each user has got their shopping cart, so that you can start to think about caching that per user, because in between adding something to their cart, <coughs> their cart doesn't change. By page, so any sort of pages that we look at, they might be specific, the same page for multiple users, but that page can be cached in its own, and then anything else that we can think about caching. So really starting to get into those underlying things like variables and uh, uh, panels, panes, everything that you can cache. Now, an important thing to think about is how long can you cache something for? A lot of people think, oh, you want to cache things for long times. Uh, so you might be caching a page for one hour or a day, but actually some things that you might be caching for as short as one minute or one second. So if you had some high volume traffic website where you've got a lot of uh, data transferring, you've got lots of updates, but you've got hundreds of users accessing that site, then maybe you want to cache that uh, for a very short period of time. And uh, I use my example uh, that I use for this uh, is Scott's program because he's in the room, and I can mention it, whose app has football scores coming in. And those scores are being updated every second, Scott? Depends when there's a goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so whenever there's a goal. So it needs to be updated very quickly. But there could be hundreds of people accessing that page every second. So you can cache it for a second and serve those hundred people. Whereas if you didn't cache it at all, that's a hundred requests to process through. So you know, even just caching something for a second can be a big performance boost for a site. So, as in about Drupal entities and what we can do to improve the performance and caching of those. So, the first module is Entity Cache. This is taking your entity from the database and caching it into your caching system. So, looking at either 
uh, memcache or Redis that you're going to have on your stack to put the uh, data, so this is going to be the data object of your entity into the cache. So you're not going out to the database every time that you need to get that entity. Particularly useful if you're using the same entity uh, many times over a short period of time. So that can be extended for the e-commerce case with commerce entity cache. So this starts to structure the commerce entities in those. And I believe that there's this other, uh, other entity providers, so other modules that provide entities are starting to move into developing these uh, modules so they, that the entities can be cached as well. So the next module is the render cache module. So this is taking the next step and is actually a, a backport uh, from the Drupal 8 caching. So this is taking the rendered entity and caching it. So caching the teaser version of the entity or the full content. Views is probably the biggest uh, interaction with the database. So we're taking our data, rendering it out into a format. And when you come to configuring your view, we, we talk about this here, um, the time that you cache your view for. And there's two choices. One is the query results and one is the rendered output. So the first uh, question, the query, is, is the actual results for the raw, raw query. So maybe you want to um, set that depending on how often your data is output and then the actual rendered output depending on, again, sort of how often the, you expect the query to update as well. So um, the query is going to invalidate the rendered output, but if the query remains the same, you don't need to re-render the rendered HTML again. So you might be tracking your query results more regularly than your rendered, the time for your rendered HTML. So if the query results don't change, don't re-render the HTML. So panels, again, has quite a lot of built-in options for caching. So again, you can set the lifetime for your panel. So this might be any part of a panel, so it's the panel page or the panel pane within the page. So if you're thinking about the levels of caching that we talked about, you've got your view might be providing a panel pane inside the panel page, or that could be inside a mini panel inside the panel page. So we're starting to build up this sort of layers of caching to find the different things. And again, here we can look at, and I forgot, no, I haven't got another slide, the granularity. So we're talking about that context. So do you want to cache this panel pane by the user or by the page that we're on or by the taxonomy term that's being referenced on the page? So if you know about panels, you can select the arguments or the context that are relevant to that page. And this uh, allows you to set that granularity based on, on that information. So uh, thinking about the roles and users that might be changing. So then we need to think about where we're going to store this cache data. So we've got two real choices, Redis or Memcache as the two systems. And both have a Drupal module for storing that data. So there's the Redis module and... Um, oh, I'll go first to the Redis module and a memcache module. When you're using either of these, you're going to need a library that communicates, and, and Redis is, my, I've found it's the best and easiest one to work with. So you've got two options, a um, PHP Redis extension. So this you need to install in your PHP, so you, this is in your uh, PHP ini file, or the Predis PHP library. And the... Um, Drupal module can use either of these uh, to work with. I haven't done any testing or research to see which is actually more, if, if there's any benefit from those. You, PHP Redis, you slight, yeah, slightly quicker. But so if you can use the PHP Redis, I'm not sure what the percentage difference is. So there's, um, I'll add the, I think there's link to these slides is already on the session on the, uh, Drupal Camp London page, so you can get to all of this information straight away. Um, so, in the settings.php file for our site, we want to start setting. So, we're going to set some variables for our site. So, we're going to look at using PHP Redis. 
Then we need to define the cash back end in Drupal's system. So bring in the Redis auto load. And then here's uh, an important consideration again in what you're going to cache and how and where you're going to cache it. So we're going to set the default class for any caching to be Redis. So that's going to start to cache variables uh, and any other data that can be cached, anything using the Drupal uh, cache function in Redis. But some things you don't want to cache in Redis. So one of those um, examples is the form. So if you're using the Drupal form, uh, so this is any, any type of form, and something happens to your Redis cache, it resets or restarts while the user is using the session, particularly if they're in a multi-step form, bang, their data's gone. Whereas the database cache just has that longer lifetime to hold the data that you're dealing with in a form. Uh, so it can be pulled back up again when the page is refreshed. Um, finally, the Drupal, uh, the Redis module and the, PA and the Memcache module both provide replacement lock and path ink files, so both the, the lock and path can be stored in Redis as well. So that's, that's uh, a big performance effectively for path lookup gains, so uh, there's, a, there's a real big performance boost there. Then we're going to look at auth cache, which is probably the biggest uh, module that we're looking at to think about how we can improve the performance against uh, logged in users. So this is a nice diagram from the auth cache module page, and it walks us through the traditional request results without any caching. So we make our request a Drupal. Drupal bootstraps, connects to the database, performs all the queries, renders the HTML, and then you might have that being compressed with your uh, server uh, and saving that to a cache like Varnish, uh, so then we're output. And then if you've got a subsequent request with Varnish, you're just coming into this cache here without actually rendering the whole thing. But once you've got your logged in user, you can't use that Varnish cache. So here, we're going to make the request and make an early bootstrap request to Drupal, retrieve the HTML that's been cached within the Drupal system for the page, which is going to be rendered, and then we can use something like Ajax to target and replace areas of the page with, so we again come back to Drupal, reconnect, perform the database query, return that, and modify the page uh, for the output. So, Back again, auth cache provides two more cache backends for your settings PHP. We're going to attempt to build a page without any database access. We want our page compression switched on, so we're going to try and compress the page. We need to make sure that we set a lifetime uh, for the pages, so we do want pages to expire as well. So once we've got auth cache enabled, we start to think about how we're going to cache things with auth cache. So here is the settings that you'd see on a block. And in the example that we're going to look at later, this is going to be our shopping cart block on the page. So we know that the shopping cart block can only be, can't, we, we can't cache it, or in this case we're not going to cache it because the price may be updating, or the availability, we need to recheck stock levels. You know, give them a warning that there's that item that they've got to be out of stock. Um, it's on a per user basis, um, and we're going to use Ajax to replace uh, this item. Uh, and in this case, if Ajax isn't available, if they can't, if they haven't got JavaScript <coughs> enabled on the browser, we're not going to be able to um, cache, so we can't cache the page. Again, uh, menus can be uh, cached with auth cache, and this is usually your something like your user or user authenticated menu, so when you start to get your menu that says, uh, hi David, welcome back to the site, click here for your, uh, your account, that type of menu item, you can start to cache those with auth cache, so that one bit is going to be replaced, so rather than just having that one bit invalidating the cache for the whole page, 
you can just replace the, the, one, the menu item. Um, so there's a setting for form cache, so this is in the auth cache setting, where we want to remove certain forms from being cached again. So this is back to our form issue. So we don't want to cache things like the search form or the block form, search API, or particularly the commerce cart form. So we want to make sure that there's no confusion in sessions and caching between multiple users. So no user sees any other person's data being cached somewhere. So this is something that's going to pick out those and say, no, we can't cache these across different users and sessions. So if you really want to, <coughs> auth cache has two options that come with the module. You can either use Ajax to replace the items, or you can use Varnish with edge size includes. So this is a system within Varnish to, as the, at the cache, level in Varnish, it takes its rendered content with a token in the page and fills in the uh, item at the end. Now you've got mixed levels of where you get pros and benefits of doing things like that. Um, so if you've got your, if you're using Varnish as a service and that is on a content delivery network, so if you've got a multinational sites that's covering <coughs> lots of countries, you need the, the, the caching and the ESI edge size bits to be as close to the user as possible. So you're um, getting the initial page render out to the user as quickly as possible. Because what we're aiming for is to get the page rendered on the user's uh, browser as quickly as possible. Um, so if you only have one Varnish server, you've got a multinational site, you're, you're still getting a delay because Varnish has to go back and do the callback to get the item and then finally render the full page before delivering it out to the user. So there's pros and cons between using the edge size includes and the uh, Ajax to replace items. Now one of the other things that we need to think about is how many items are you going to replace with this because uh, if you've got a page and then 10 items that you're going to replace that actually might take longer because you've got 10 subsequent bootstraps to Drupal to fill in those small gaps. So there's a, a way from balancing how you can combine those areas make sure that you're going to get the best out of the, the performance gain or loss that you're going to get through the different uh, types of setup. So some other modules to think about that can uh, uh, benefit the Drupal side before your uh, site's going out. Advanced CSS and JavaScript aggregation. Uh, does anyone use this module on their sites? Good few? Yep. So this one's uh, really, really quick on uh, benefiting of compressing and combining files. Uh, what I think here, Google page speed, SEO tools are all picking these up as important things that you want to make sure that uh, you're minimizing the uh, delivery time for these secondary assets. Um, Fast 404, uh, so here uh, improving the, the 404 page not found responses. Uh, so you're not hitting and using up server power to, to deliver those. Ultimate cron uh, for back-end improvements. The first thing, uh, you know when Drupal cron runs, it clears all caches. So at, uh, if you've got something that requires a cron run every five minutes, it's really bad to then just clear every, all your caches every five minutes. But if you're talking about an e-commerce site, you're doing maybe stock syncing to a cert, to some other server every five minutes via cron. So ultimate cron allows you to control all of the items in the cron queue and set them individual times. And by default, it, it removes all of those things that Drupal does out of the box that really it shouldn't be doing every time. Uh, this, since I did this presentation, where I did it uh, at the last Drupal camp, has now been uh, merged into uh, the mail system, uh, but there's still a further improvement to come to the mail system. If anyone is using the mail system module in their Drupal site, it um, loads all the mail system classes every tape, every load, and this is just putting that into a cache. So it's been pushed into if we were using our system, it'd be one of those class cache classes that would now be going into Redis and so on. But 
<coughs> it's now in the latest ver dev version of the module, but it, it wasn't for a long time. I picked this up with a, a site that we were dealing with, and this was the slowest, <coughs> slowest query, slowest uh, query on the on the page, every page, adding something like uh, um, I don't know, ten millisecond query to every page. So, you know, all of these things add up. So, my live demo. So I quickly this morning rebuilt this because I uh, deleted it from. Uh, last time I'd done this presentation, so so I've built a nice shop which doesn't look very nice in this. See if I can run it. There we go. So I've built a quick e-commerce store. So here is my uh, e-commerce store. I've got a, a view um, with our products here got add to cart on all of these and uh, I've, I've got one added to my cart here. So this is Drupal out of the box with no uh, caching or anything configured on it. Uh, so here, just to note, I've got the page uh, speed in, in network in uh, Chrome and I've disabled caching here so it's going to reload all the assets that are on the page so we're going to include images here as well. So we've got a, um, a, a final load time of 4.31 seconds. The DOM was loaded in 2.3 seconds. And what you can see here <coughs> up at the top, looking at our um, time to uh, load the actual page. So here we were at 1.91 seconds. And... Here I've got the same site, uh, this is a different development branch, and this time I've enabled all of the AuthCache modules, I've enabled all those items in the settings.php, uh, and we should see, hopefully, also page load improvement. Yeah. So now our uh, page load for the actual page has gone down. Here we had 1.91 seconds, so nearly two seconds uh, here to 486 milliseconds, so we're less than half a second now for the page load of the, the render page mail. So we've got the view uh, is set to cache for an hour, so it's caching that in the Redis DB. It's then got the page rendered through auth cache and if I look in the item, so the total page was 1.9, so that was the total for the whole item. You'll see here, this item here is our auth cache query. So we're going to the item auth cache modules or auth cache here for our, our commerce cart. So we can see at the end we're adding 610 milliseconds here to bring in and pull in the, the commerce cart at the end via Ajax. <coughs> So um, you can see that's, that's actually you think, you know, a huge difference in the actual page load speed. So we're getting getting uh, half the time on the, the page load, and most of that page load speed here, you can see looking at this, is taken up with those images. <coughs> so if we're actually just thinking about the page speed, we're we're going down from from two nearly two seconds to half a second. So that's a uh, three quarter reduction in what the time was before. Um, what I also will do here as well, now I don't know if has anyone ever used uh, the black fire from the Sensio Labs? We've got one at the back there. So this is a tool by Blackfire for doing uh, your back end, seeing how that's performing as well. So there's a Blackfire uh, program running on the server as well. So I can profile this page. So we can actually see <coughs> what's happening in the background. So the the queries, the HTML, the, the PHP process flow that's going through. Uh, 
Ah. <laughs> this thatch bit that I'm trying to do should be... Uh, it should be on the free version, so I don't need to upgrade. I click on here, shared profiles, untitled. Ah, I think I need to remove my other one. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't actually get to testing this bit. <laughs> I think. Let me just try this again because what I did was do that. Well, handily, because it could go wrong, I have screenshots of <laughs> the bits that can go wrong. So this was... Uh, uh, the previous example, so I did get screenshots. So we're seeing something similar here. So there's a bit of network information here. So we can see on my previous example, we went down from 477 milliseconds to 69, so it was even quicker. But I think this, the university network here seems to be a bit slower than Edinburgh University's network. So, uh, And here was the, bl the black fire analysis of the two sites without and with the cache. Uh, so we can see that um, the time spent for the server processing the site was 531 milliseconds without the cache, as opposed to 2.05 milliseconds with the caching. Uh, so the biggest thing here, you can see the processing time um, is going down from 538 milliseconds to 1.47 milliseconds. So the, the actual work for the server is going down a huge amount as well. Um, I think this is for the amount of DB query time as well. Uh, oh no, this is data, so which one is? That's the network. Oh, here, yes. <laughs> so we had no DB queries, yeah. So we've gone down from 52 milliseconds <coughs> to nothing. Because the page is all being rendered from, from uh, Redis. Uh, so Drupal 8, there's two uh, great presentations from uh, Drupal Camp, uh, Drupal Con. Uh, these were both at, I don't remember if these, one, whether they were both at Barcelona, I think. So these are both at Barcelona. So this is the two sessions on, one is about how Drupal 8's caching, so a lot of this auth cache type idea is built into Drupal 8 now, using the big pipe idea and process. So this is how we can build in this tokenization effectively of what uh, AuthCache is doing straight into Drupal 8. And then another one looking at caching at the edge. This is using a CDN um, or so this is there's a lot of providers providing what we call C varnish in the cloud or CDN. So this could be Amazon CloudFront or Fastly or any of these types of service where they provide that in, the, in their caching system as well. So they have the edge side includes or server side includes type process in there, which uh, works there as well. So any questions? 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's generally Redis is seen as it's this new, slightly newer option, so Redis. But if, I mean, there's a sort, of, sort of levels of benefit. You're, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and it's, and, but the, the, another thing that's easy to happen with memcache is um, some of the, the variables that Drupal stores are very big. And uh, if you um, are trying to put a variable that's too big for a memcache item into memcache, the performance then just drops suddenly down. It, it just doesn't fail. That's something that I've seen on, on site before where the item, it's normally the fields cache. So this is the list of all the fields. So if you've got a lot of fields, that one item that's getting stored in the cache, if it's too big for memcache to store, memcache just dies and then you lose all of your performance gains. So um, there's this, you know, pros and cons and experiences I've had with each of them. So, yeah, uh, so um, I think that's a, it, whichever is, uh, some ways quickest to set up just to get the, the benefits there and then you can look at refining because swapping between Redis and Memcache in terms of the Drupal modules is not, um, you know, they're just, it's just swapping the module, doesn't affect anything else. It's, it should be a sort of agnostic for Drupal, whichever caching uh, backend you're going to use. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned earlier on the render cache module yes. for Drupal 7. Yes. What does that add on beyond using you know, hash cache within a render array in D7, which is supported by core? I guess it's kind of adding something to that. I'm not quite sure what it brings to the table. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly either. It's Are you able to answer that? So it does that automatically. So while you would have to manually add the hash cache to the render array, yeah. it's doing it out of the box. Or what's it used for the parts, for the pieces, for the caching of these? Um, I don't actually know. I just I just know it's doing that automatically for all the entities you have to find. So it's kind of hooking into the core bit. Yeah. For you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. uh, I have an interesting uh, question, I think. Uh, I think discussing yesterday we found a little bit early. And is it not just that, for example, on one of the news pages, uh, I don't think it's the newspapers, uh, is that the system when you log in Drupal, and you are authenticated user, the code can be stored and it's automatically there. Is it just one set of hash or is it something different? Because on some other systems, there's like you publish an article and it's like, let's say, every 10 minutes, all the articles are being published because of the, let's say, like cron job, let's say, or something. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got. Been cleared by every, like, say, you've also got an action of uh, cache invalidation as well. Um, so this is where your, um, which I yeah, haven't got included in that, is the invalidate module. So this is particularly to work with um, things like varnish and things like that. So you're, if you're adding a new art article, it will then propagate an instruction out to other services to say, <coughs> we've added something new. Whatever your time was on these pages or these URLs, we need to clear those because there's been a change and we want to invalidate the cache and make sure that that change happens straight away. Can, you, can we trigger like, uh, the cache group? Mm. Yeah, it's a... David, for example, from one of my sites that I run, when there's a go in a football game, yeah. I get post, I get posted the, the XML update, which I enter into the database, yes. and there's a couple of rules modules that then go and invalidate the caches for those views where that score appears. So rather than clear your whole cache, yes, I'm just clearing the cache for the live score state. Right. And uh, then if you were at the keynote yesterday from Clifton, um, we run a site called Time Power Education. And when an editor posts a news article, um, or someone comments on a news article, we don't want to clear, again, the whole of Drupal's cache. Exactly, that makes we, well. we clear, um, so we have some funny cache triggers, so we know that that article appears in the homepage news feed. Or particular category we need to and we clear that. Or if someone's commenting on a news article, 
we don't want to again clear all the groups of caches, we just clear the caches for that one page. Oh. And I think cache actions is the module, and then there's all yeah. cache actions or all cache Yes, actions. yeah, yes, there's a so ten minutes. Yep. <coughs> there's, there's a cache action. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a cache actions and then uh, modules that go on from that. So it's what it's does module uh, invalidate? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, it's either called invalidate or uh, that's one of the actions in the cache action module. Okay. Uh, when you say clear the cache for one page, is that the varnish level or, or so on, on plans and education that I work on, we do an X page to classes that are effectively our varnish for the service. Okay. Um, so Drupal still has a cache then it's just going to go and get the cache. So we do, we do both. We do an X page to varnish and we also clear the cache key for our Drupal page. Yeah. Um, so that we use panels a lot, and um, each panel has its own cache key. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So your 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 because that's that's it. Your your Drupal can clear the things, but you, if you've got a, another layer of caching, your Varnish or like Fastly or these other services, cache underscore actions, uh, like CloudFront or something, you need to go and tell that that it's it's whatever it had as well. And now it's now invalid because it's not it's not going to check. So. You, when we, um, one of those items that I covered was the maximum lifetime. So if you're using a, a, a caching, a CDN service, it knows after whatever that maximum lifetime is, it's going to recheck back with the server to get a new version, to check that the server's version hasn't changed. Um, but what we're just doing with the, the cache actions is, is pushing that action out to say, this page has changed it's, uh, as, a, as a secondary action of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, is ESI with Offcache stable and used to the right? Uh, I don't know what the current state is of that. Is. I don't. I've not. I've not found. Is it, uh, Offcache applies a sample varnish config uh, for yeah, yeah. version three of varnish and version four of varnish. Okay. Unfortunately, Fastly, which is the only uses that kind of hacked version of version two of varnish, so it's quite complicated and took us quite a long time to get that to work. But, um, it is stable, yeah. Okay. Um, SSI, the Nginx version of ESI, is not. But I don't think it would be too much work to do, oh, yeah. maybe. It's, it's more about your varnish configuration than the Drupal configuration yeah. and, and matching the two up of how everyone's configured it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? How much does that work? <laughs> <laughs> you should, you can sign up for a free version that you, you profile. I don't, I can't remember how much the uh, the pro version. Is the free one actually useful, like first of all, developer? Yes. So the free one lets you do a simple profile. The the paid one allows you to do uh, like more detailed test scenes, like uh, uh, scenarios and, and put in changes and, and run, like run more detailed tests. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and it has yeah background monitoring as well. So it's like you're getting into the new relic type realm as well. So it's doing the background uh, monitoring. Just the last two questions. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the environment, uh, Apache Contra, Nginx, first question. So is it more recommended to use Nginx in terms of? Yep. Thank you. And the second <laughs> question. <laughs> That's that's what the system that I use uses. Uh, I'm not a dev. Uh, I'm not an ops engineer, so I, I'm not a specialist on that. But yeah, I what I've heard, MarioDB is the uh, yeah. But I'm sure you could misconfigure MarioDB to as badly performing as MySQL. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much.